In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of our death, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. <laughs> the Church, in her sacred liturgy and devotions, uses two main methods to communicate the mysteries of our faith and the life of Christ to us, and to make visible those things that are invisible by her prayers, hymns, chants, and readings, and also by the external signs and symbols that accompany her sacraments, not just of the Holy Mass, but in the other sacraments and also the sacramentals. In moving from the time of after Pentecost to the season of Advent, there is now a visible shift in these signs. The vestments are a more sombre color. The organ is silent and the gloria is taken away from us for these few short weeks. Now the saints and the doctors of the church in interpreting the life of Christ as it is portrayed in the sacred liturgy tell us that there are in fact not one but three advents of our savior. The first is his advent in the flesh 2000 years ago. In, in which he takes on our humanity, he lives like us, and goes on to be judged unjustly and to be rejected by us. The second advent is in spirit and power, which takes place now, in which he sanctifies us with his grace. And the third advent is his advent in glory and majesty in the future, in the judgment, when he will judge all men with justice. While all these advents share the fact that they are arrivals or appearances of our Savior in the world, there is, of course, a difference in the manner of those appearances. In the first, as the newborn baby 2,000 years ago, he came as a lamb, meek and defenseless. In the second, now by his spirit and sanctifying power, he comes to us as the most tender and compassionate of friends embracing us and filling us with himself in the sacraments, especially in the Holy Eucharist. But in the third, at the judgment, he will come as a lion, exacting perfect justice from all men. And yet, surprisingly, do we see in the gospel of today an emphasis not on the first advent, his birth in the stable 2,000 years ago, or his second, his presence with us through grace, but the third, his advent as the just judge. It does this by using our Lord's own words in describing the signs of the end times. Why is this? Why choose the third advent, the coming of the Savior, as a lion, a judge, when we are now preparing for him as the innocent child in the manger? Concerning the liturgical celebrations of Advent, Abbot Dom Granger writes the following, and you've heard this quote before. Let those then who are not touched by the tidings of the coming heavenly physician and the good shepherd who give us his life for his sheep meditate during Advent on the awful and yet certain truth that so many render the redemption unavailable to themselves by refusing to cooperate in their own salvation. They may treat the child who is to be born with disdain, but he is also the mighty God. And do they think they can withstand him on that day when he is to come, not to save as now, but to judge? Let these people use the liturgy of this season and they will learn how much he is to be feared by sinners. How true these words are from the 19th century as we discussed on the Feast of Christ the King that the writings of the saints, popes and theologians down through the ages often seem even more fitted for our time than for their own. Today, is he indeed rejected and ignored, even scorned? But it's also very tempting when we hear these things to think of Abbot Garanger's warning as being for someone else and not for us. Yes, there are sinners out there who reject our Lord. How awful. But what about the sinner in here who rejects him every time he sins? In the grace-filled season of Advent, the church in her liturgy and in her practices is earnestly striving to move our souls to repentance for our sins, to meditate on the wonder of Christ's incarnation and to remove the obstacles to the abundant graces that his incarnation offers us through the devout assistance in the mysteries presented, but also, most importantly, to keep our minds and hearts looking at the day when we will stand before him as a judge. 
But why this last point? Why not just anticipate the arrival of the newborn king with the anticipation, joy, and wonder that his birth undoubtedly brings to those properly disposed? Firstly, because the incarnation is the beginning of Christ's redemptive work among us, but the judgment is the end, the culmination. Our Lord, through the work of the Holy Ghost and the liturgy, would have us keep our eyes on the goal, and so by preparing for one, we also prepare for the other. Secondly, his arrival as the child Jesus, his living in obscurity, his public life and teaching, and finally his suffering and death on the cross are all examples for us in how to live and die in preparation for that judgment that all men, believers and non-believers, must undergo. Our Savior would never impose on us something as important as judgment and not lead us by his very own example in order to best prepare us for it. And third, the anticipation of Christ in the manger as the child Jesus mirrors and prepares us for the anticipation of his arrival as judge. How is this? In both, there is sorrow and penance for sins, but also the admixture of joy that soon in both we are to be united with our head our king. In the first way, we are mystically united to the child Jesus in the manger. In the second, we are united to him in reality when we die. Again, to prepare for the former is to prepare for the latter. Now we remember that the church's perennial philosophy teaches us that man is a composite being made of body and soul. Now, While man has that soul moved by external things and gains all knowledge from the external world via his senses, the church, in her infinite wisdom, knows best how to move man through the sacred signs in her liturgy by stimulating man's senses in the sights, sounds, and even smells of her liturgy. The Holy Ghost, the one who inspires the church in her different liturgical practices throughout the centuries, is, of course, the world's greatest psychologist, understanding the inner workings of the hearts and minds of men so perfectly that he knows exactly how to move us. The liturgy, then, is, in a sense, a masterpiece of divine psychology. Some of the signs, then, that are presented to us in Advent are the following. The four weeks mirrors the 4,000 years that the Israelites waited for the Messiah. The vestments of violet to remind us of the sackcloth and ashes those devout Israelites wore in penance before his coming. The Gloria, the great hymn of praise, is removed because it is not yet time for the angels to sing the angelic hymn upon his arrival. And yet, this mournfulness and austerity is still tinged with joy. The Sundays still have the Alleluia. In three weeks, the violet will be put aside for rose on Gaudete Sunday, a brief joyful reminder that the arrival of the infant king is so close. But what then to do with these signs? What do they actually mean for us? And what can we do about them? By knowing these signs and reminding ourselves of their meanings, we can move ourselves to penance, to sorrow for our sins and a firm purpose of amendment in our recurring faults. And by keeping our eyes on the arrival as the, as the child king, but also the just judge, we can prepare internally for both occasions. We must remember Christ also became incarnate for non-believers and oppressors, Let us meditate, as we heard Garanger tell us, on the awful but certain truth that so many render the redemption unavailable to themselves. They treat, he said, the child with disdain. They ignore or even mock him and insult our tiny baby Jesus, but they will one day have to stand before him as their judge. If ever there was an age that rejected the divine child, that scorned him and insulted him, it is most certainly this one. Not only does it ignore and mock him, it seeks to interfere with his creation. It attempts to reset his world in its own image. It tries to change the reality of what a man or a woman is. It attacks and scandalizes its most innocent and unborn and even discards them when they are unwanted. And yet, we can cooperate vitally with our Lord's redemptive action by praying for those who do these things or who believe that these things are right, especially those that are dear to us, during this abundant season of grace. Finally, it was by the fiat of the Blessed Virgin that Christ became incarnate and was given to all of us, as if the whole creation waited, holding its breath for her agreement to be the mother of the creator, 
And it is by her intercession for us that we will be able to benefit more fully from the signs and mysteries that the church presents to us this Advent. We can call on her at all times during Advent, but perhaps particularly during our praying of the joyful mysteries of the Rosary and in our upcoming celebration of the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. We can ask her for special help with those recurring sins that have perhaps impeded the many graces in Advent's past. Again and again, each year of our lives, these profound mysteries are presented to us, and so all of us should grow each year in a deeper appreciation of the wonder of the incarnation. Each year, we should be making progress with those same faults and failings. Each year, we should grow in greater love and intimacy of this divine King, who, with the Holy Ghost, desires to move our hearts to prepare us for this advent so that we will be prepared for his third and his last. How many advents and Christmases have all of us in in this church undergone in our lives? Certainly several thousand. And what faults and sins do we all still carry each and every year, even though the Savior tries to move us to abandon them? How much progress has there been with our predominant fault if we've even had the ability to identify it? Or what virtue have we been consistently in need of uh, increasing year after year, advent after advent? And yet we have not. If, If we were to ask ourselves this advent, what is the biggest obstacle I have each and every year to the graces this tiny but majestic king brings to me, what would the answer be? Why not ask ourselves today at the beginning of this advent, what is the one great obstacle I need to attack this year? And yet, this reflection should not cause despondency in us, a despair that sees such striving as hopeless, but a hope, a great hope in the incarnation that every year he calls to you personally through his sacred signs and mysteries. Each year he strives to move you yet even closer to his crib, for the child is literally consumed with the desire to have you with him for eternity. And he is not about to let your same recurring faults stop that from happening, but keeps gently calling to you to persevere. The Blessed Virgin is about, is about to start her own preparation for the arrival of her son. How profound must her preparation have been and how profound her intercessory power for us now to enter into our preparation for him if only we will ask her. Let us all of us try to ensure that this Advent we will start to respond to his calling for this preparation. The voice of the tiny child that calls from his first coming so that we are ready with confidence and hope for his last. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.